And as you know, we're unable to actually see you, but please know that as panelists, Dean Tool, Carl Ron, and I can see your name. So rest assured, we know you're here and we really appreciate your support and we look forward to your participation. I can see that a few more of you are continuing to join us and I'm not at all surprised. Today's guest of honor, honor Carl Ron, will be sharing with us information that is pertinent and intriguing to all of us, including folks like me who are not engineers. Some of you may already know me. If not, please feel free to reach out after the event. My name is Jennifer Hall and I serve as the Director of Development for the University of Toledo Foundation, where I have the honor of working very closely with the College of Engineering. As I already mentioned, we're unable to see your video and hear your audio. However, you can freely chat with us by using the chat box, which you should already be able to see on your screen. If you don't see it already, just head on down to the bottom right hand corner of your screen where you should be able to see a little chat icon. Once you click it, the chat panel will appear. This is how you will be able to submit questions directly to Carl, Dean Tool, and to me throughout today's town hall. And finally, if you wanna change the view on your screen, you might want to expand it or see multiple people at once, or just see the person who's talking, just head up to the right corner and you'll see an option to expand or reduce your screen. If you have any issues, just send a chat message to me at any point and I'll help you out. Okay, let's switch gears and get things started by turning things over to the Dean of the College of Engineering, Mike Tool. Thank you, Jen. I appreciate uh, having us. Uh, you're getting your leadership and in initiating the series has gone real well, and I'm very excited about this one. Um, I got to point out here in Toledo, uh, for those of our guests who are on, and I've got the list and I'm looking at all my old friends and folks and new friends that are, are participating today. We have almost 100 people. I'll say to Kevin David, Kevin and I and his wife Karen and my wife Amy rode 65 miles together and uh, a ride, the Irish Hills ride. So Kevin, I'm still a little sore from that ride, but thanks again, that was, that was enjoyable. Um, again, some, some old friends that I see. So thank you for joining us. And I know some people, as Jen said, you'll get the link afterwards. Um, I gotta tell you, I'm in a, a while it's rainy here in U Toledo, uh, you see Carl, who I'll introduce in the back out in Palo Alto, California, where he lives. And you'll see not only the flowers, but he mentioned that one of the plants in the background is an avocado plant. So I don't think we have that in Toledo. So we'll hear from Carl in just a second. I tell you, I'm in a great mood today. Uh, and for this reason, Jen Hall and I drove up yesterday three and a half hours to St. Joe's, Michigan. My first time up there, right in Western Michigan. Had a great visit with uh, Roy and Marcia Arms. As you know, uh, wonderful leaders in the university. Roy is actually a national a trustee for the university, and, and it's those that have uh, endowed and launched the Roy Marsha Arms Engineering Leadership Institute. So it was just really nice connecting with them. Also spent, had a nice dinner with uh, Bill and Jane Marone. Now the connection there is that Roy and Bill were both executives at uh, Whirlpool for many, many years. And just what was really interesting, which well, two things. One, listening to them both say very, very clear, very authentic. If it wasn't for you, Toledo, and their engineering degree, th their careers would not have been possible. And, and that's what I love about Carl, too. We'll talk about that. He's built on so many other things, but really nice to hear Roy and, uh, and, and Bill talk about that. Roy went from being a, a senior VP at Whirlpool to CEO of Cooper Tires down in Finley. So again, just right, not, not wonderful stories to hear about that. And so, you know, it's so it's my honor to be at a college of engineering that launches so many fantastic careers. And I know a lot of our friends on the on the call today, similar fantastic careers. And uh, again, how could I not feel good about all that? So, um, in fact, let me uh, also tell you about some other good things that I'm going to share with you a picture yesterday from there we go. Okay, you should see on the screen now a picture of the Nagi Naganathan conference room. And those are the current members, or many of them, of the Roy and Marsha Arms Engineering Leadership Institute. Well, first of all, I gotta tell you folks, this is 7 a.m. yesterday morning, right? So these are these students. They are so high, hard charging, high initiative, wonderful people, articulate, looking to pursue improving their personal growth, their personal development, their professional development, their communication skills, their strategic skills. So it's all part of the, the ELI, the Engineering Leadership Institute. They meet at seven in the morning, 
because many of them that are going off to co-ops or they have an eight o'clock class and they're so busy with all their activities. So I was proud to be there with them. I was one who snapped the picture. And but I tell you this also because it illustrates what's happening this semester. And that is we are back in the class and we're back at the campus all in, right? We've been in the football suites. It's great. Still masks. Whenever you're indoor, we're wearing masks indoors but no social distancing. So we are able to have all our students in our class. Of course, we're still worrying about hygiene, the spray and all that and contact tracing if we need to, but it's going really well. U Toledo, if you remember during the pandemic, during the height of it, we always had some of the lowest numbers in the state, even though we had some of the highest face-to-face -face instruction. So very, very proud of that. And then within U Toledo, the College of Engineering students have always been very well behaved. So just a couple positive cases. So that's all good. So I just wanted to share that with you, that that list of show those students, and I really enjoy those. So I'll, I'll take that down now and let's see, stop sharing. Okay. And the other thing is that I wanted to talk about is just some neat things that are happening here at the university. Uh, actually, let's do the kind of bad news first. The bad news is, you know, we're in classes. That's good. Enrollment is down at the University of Toledo, at about seven and a half percent and down even a little more than that in the College of Engineering. And some of you are saying, Mike, what the heck happened? It used to be College of Engineering was always the one that was increasing, and that's true. Um, what happened is this, honestly, you know, you try new innovations, and many of you I know are leaders, and you have this issue of centralization versus decentralization and letting individuals run. Well, we brought in a vice president for enrollment management. I won't mention his name. He's no longer here who was insistent that we do the centralized and we lost our college recruiters, the ones that were in the high schools. And so we tried that experiment. I protested, but we tried. It didn't work. We're going back to what Nagy and Brian Randolph and others did so well for so many years. Um, and that is to have our college recruiters out in the high schools talking, of course, about U Toledo and the brand, but also talking about rocket engineering because we know I'm biased. We have the best college in the university and we should be very proud of the things that we have. So we're going to get there again. We'll get that enrollment again. I could tell you we're working very hard with our staff to do some new initiatives, right? And reach new students. They don't listen to phone calls. They don't do the hard mailings. There's text. There's all kinds of things. So anyway, roll it down. We'll get it back up. The other the really neat thing is just, to, I guess, at the kind of end of my updates is three good news. First of all, uh, we know that Toledo has been a, a bastion, a center for innovation, particularly in glass, now leading to even solar energy, right? And so we are able to have the honor of celebrating the life of a very important person, Norman Nitschke. And that was in August 17th. I'm sitting here in the Nitschke Hall. Oh, next to us is uh, next to Nitschke Auditorium, where the celebration is had. Next to that is the Nitschke celebra or commercialization uh, place. So, you know, it was so nice to celebrate his life. He lived to 100 years old. We couldn't celebrate it during the pandemic. We decided the time was right. It was still a masked event, but it was really neat having that together. And again, made me very proud of what U Toledo is. We had a number of leaders in the region, including Representative Marcy Captor, and it was a very neat event. The other thing that makes me feel very, very good, that Nitschke Auditorium where we honored Norm Nitschke in, on October 8th, we're going to have that to host the incoming or current president of University of Toledo, the 17th president, Dr. Gregory Postel. And I can tell you, I and the rest of the deans, very pleased with his leadership. So happy the trustees made that, you know, People will always sometimes criticize processes and everything. Hey, we got the great leader on board and he's doing some amazing things. So I'm very excited about his inauguration or investiture on October 8th. And I'm very pleased with the leadership that's here at University of Toledo. Also have some last thing to tell you, some leadership, new leadership in the College of Engineering. I finally got my full team. So uh, four associate deans, six department chairs. Very pleased that uh, this summer through a national search, Dr. Leon Chang, from Lehigh University joined us as the new chair of electrical engineering and computer science. And just so pleased with all the leadership he's doing, what's happening, his faculty are already uh, making real good progress, phenomenal grants, uh, external funding. Uh, so anyway, lots all good. So I'm very pleased with that. So that's the updates I wanted to, to share with you from campus. And um, you know, if you have any questions, we'll do that. But I wanna jump now into our VIP guest and 
Carl, I'm so pleased again that you gave us time. You're going to hear everybody in a second that he is doing some amazing things, very, very busy, but he's with us today. So let me just tell you very quickly about him. And then as we go through some questions, and Carl and I have talked about him, prepped him a little bit, and I even have some slides to help get through those, some of those things to, so you see him clearly. Um, you know, Carl just brings a ton of, of innovation, a ton of experience with it. And just very quickly, his bio, um, born in Cleveland, he is a, uh, he was a twin. His, his brother, he tells me, is also a, an entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur, now in Georgia, doing some different, different types. Um, he was a class of 1980 chemical engineer and then went on to have a fantastic career that's still occurring. He was vice president for R&D as well as general manager for new business at Procter & Gamble, right? When you talk about world-class organizations, the ones who lead or are just spot known, spot on for known for new products, that's P&G, and Carl was responsible. So the, part of what we're gonna do today is talk about some of those things um, and, and what are some of his products. But then it's really neat that he's moved from some consumer products onto healthcare, which of course our nation needs very much, always focused on innovation. And at, towards the end, we'll talk about how big data is part of that as well. And, and Carl's, I've just gotten to know him over the years. I probably visited Carl, I think, like three or four times out in California and here. He was on the visiting advisory board, which was wonderful. Um, you know, I just learn so much every time we get together. So we're going to hear more about that. Um, I'm going to show Carl, so welcome, uh, if I could. Now, Bethany, I'm seeing Jen Hall's uh, blank screen on there. And I, I'm not sure if that's me or what, but um, Maybe so if Carl I starts talking, yeah, if you start speaking, go ahead. Let's so, see. hey, thank you there so much you for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure. Um, to be here. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's just wonderful. It's you know it's been a long time, but I I do remember it was Dana Hall when I was when I was there that we were in a different building, and um, I remember um, your, one of your predecessors basically saying, you know, you're here for four for forty. Well, you know, after four years of being there and graduating, I guess we're doing the retrospective on the forty. <laughs> so so it's a pleasure to talk with you all today. house and uh, that, whoop, that whole vibe is just wonderful. So thank you for joining us from Palo Alto. Hey, I want to share a screen that I think just helps some people understand some of the things that um, uh, that's it. So let's see. I think you should be it. Okay, there we go. Do you see that? Um, are you seeing the full screen, Carl? No, you you seeing... the presenter view. Oh, that's not what I want. Okay, let's try that again. Stop sharing. That's what it was we had practice at, but um, thank you. Let me uh, try another one here. There it is. Let's do that. How's that better? Great. Okay, great. So t if you don't mind, talk us, because these are some classic, you know, some real legacy uh, things that are still very successful. Tell us about your involvement there, what we can kind of learn from your successes there. I think the... Um... You know, some brands, uh, you know, so Procter & Gamble has many very big brands. Pampers is a $12 billion brand. And, and the thought to me is, is that um, important thing in my mind has always been, how do you take something that you were given and make sure that it's, you know, better, but not just incrementally better, a lot better if you possibly can. And I just want to say life is not about me. It's about the team of people. And I was lucky to be in the right place with a lot of people to do the right things. But I do believe I had a critical role in the success of those. But Pampers is a very big brand. And and just as an example, you just have to reinvent them every so often. And so it used to be when I wore diapers, um, they would have been small, medium, and large and things like that. And we looked at it and, and said, no, the right thing to do is, is to is to really think about the mother baby interaction and so we moved for years now diapers have been swaddlers and cruisers and all these other kinds of things that represented the um the challenges that mothers were facing and then we designed product against them and so it's a major repositioning of a big brand to keep it contemporary and keep it growing and and that changed the landscape of an existing business and so but Really, the kind of the more fun stuff is, is I've been fortunate to help create some new to the world brands as well as, you know, like Swiffer and Febreze. And um, 
I always like when I'm at the University of Toledo, I can ask the students, your mother does the laundry for you when you take it home, okay, or whatever, or you postpone it, but you use Febreze in the interim. <laughs> so, so we make money off of, you know, kind of, you know, in addition to the old businesses, building on new businesses. And so, so to keep a company like Procter & Gamble from 1837 growing, you have to contemporize your old brands, but you also have to create new ones. Probably the most fun brand, you know, that I ever worked on was Mr. Clean. Um, people would line up to meet Mr. Clean when we had an actor playing Mr. Clean. Um, but Mr. Clean Magic Eraser is a revolutionary little product. And the thing is, we didn't invent it. We found it around the world and then in Japan and created a large new business by focusing on the proper problems and, and getting it out there. And people love this. It, if I mention it at a holiday party, you get grabbed to the side by somebody who says, you got to go meet the guy who, you know, invented Magic Eraser. And, you know, it's just a, sometimes it's the small things in life. But I think the career has been a career of creating new things. That's what led me out here to Silicon Valley, because now rather than managing billions of dollars of business as well, I just focus on creating billion dollar businesses. Wonderful. Well, let me um, let me stop sharing here, and I want to show you uh, the last thing that you saw there, but didn't talk about, and that is your book that you co-authored. I think 2010, as I recall. I had the pleasure of reading this book recently, folks. You can get it on Amazon. This isn't a book tour. That's not what this is about. Carl wasn't even going to mention it, but I mentioned it. Um, but it's as you see, the reciprocity be advantage. So if you do Carl Ron and Google it. Um, I don't understand why that book, I didn't hear about it, why I didn't read the HBR, Harvard Business Review article on it. Just real quick, tell us about how that book came about, your you co-author and, and some key concepts from that. And I remember VUCA, which I hope we'll talk about later. Yeah, and so um, my co-author is Bob um, Johansson. And Bob, I've known him for a lot of years, and I moved out into his land. He was already out here in Palo Alto, and we'd worked together. And um, we realized that, the, to make a big change, um, you kind of have to pair people who are complementary to each other rather than are more of the same. And and so the question was, how do you get big companies to work with little companies and actually not you know crush each other or get frustrated? And it's to realize that we have different things that we offer each other, and those together can create something very new. And so the book, in the end, really. Um, we use it to help. I, I consult with some companies as well, and we talk about how we work with their innovation portfolio to get top line growth. And Bob and I have worked together on that. The saddest thing for me is, is having worked at a big company and little ones now that we create is big companies die because what they do is they get stuck in a rut. And, um, and so how do we think differently about their portfolio? And so that's what this book was about. Um, being able to try to create those new businesses, leveraging small and big together. Very good. And and I remember a couple things. Uh, first of all, you you mentioned in the book, of, I'm a guru, disciple of Michael Porter, right, from Harvard Business School. And in fact, if you look behind, maybe you can see I've got some of his books right behind me. Um, but what you did is, where I really liked one of your things was you're saying, hey, it's not A or B, it's A plus B. So it's reciprocity and advantage. And how, you know, you really, I thought, brought a nice thing of, contributing to the old ish strategic issue of in-house versus outsourcing. And you did it in a really different way. And I think on a, on a very much looking at the future. Uh, so I, I think it's a wonderful book and I, I encourage that. You know, the current world is yes, but, and you apply constraints. The future world is yes, and, and you, you embrace the constraints. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Well, if anybody in the audience want to have a book club with me sometime on strategic thinking or whatever, maybe we we'll get Carl to help lead a book. So, so that's a great one. Hey, let's go on, if I may, to uh, talk about because when you and I have talked about leadership during our, our visits together, really enjoyed it. You know, you have this strong idea that even though people might, you could have this, maybe your success, all the things you've done without being an engineer. Um, you think, you know, that it very much contributes and you see engineers as great leaders and you you shared some principles with me. If you don't mind, I'm going to put those on the screen, Carl, and let you kind of talk them through just so people don't see it. So let me see if I can do this again better. And do you see engineers as leaders full screen now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think that 
there's a problem with the word engineer and it's a problem for people who aren't engineers and it's also a problem for people who are engineers um and um and and there's this kind of some if we're thinking about leaders people can put engineers into a box that doesn't include leaders they they see them as great problem solvers but somehow or another somebody else has to tell them what to do and um and and they're wrong. Okay, in other words, you know, that's a bad construct. The problem is, is sometimes we as engineers, and I am an engineer, definitely, um, we put ourselves in that box, you know. And so what I was looking for is constructs, and these are things that I actually use because I used to manage um, a thousand engineers, okay, at Procter and Gamble, um, as well as myself. Is is that the problem is is to be a leader, what you actually have to do is think about three things. You're being paid to grow your business, okay, and so solve those problems. But you have to also grow the people that you work with, and you have to grow yourself. And so you have three problems. And if you can grow all three of those, you will be a leader. You'll be, you'll be leading, and you'll be seen as a leader. And so you can't set low goals. You have to set high goals. Um, you know, they're only going to hire good engineers. <laughs> and so they're going to get stuff done. The question is, is what are you going to get done that others didn't get done? And and so that's that's about thinking about the problem more broadly. So getting the results, but you can't wait for people to define what's needed. And and it's a continual quest of you're, you're going to find out if it's new that there are big gaps. And so you're going to have to go and find what's missing so that you can actually get those amazing um, results. And for myself, then, that becomes a continual journey. I, I think of myself as an innovator, but one of my innovation projects is me. <laughs> you know? and, and so you're then going to say, hey, if that was missing, I'll have to master that capability, too. And it leads to growth for your business, growth for your people, and growth for yourself. That's great. And you know what? Actually, your, your wonderful principles there fits in and what you were just alluding to was one of the questions that was sent in. So, so out of the you know nearly 100 pre-registrants um, sent in some, and I wanna ask you that, and that'll go on to the next question. And, and by the way, folks can add questions now. I won't be able to see it, but I think Jen Hall might be able to see it um, and add those questions and we'll address them at the end. But I have about, oh, about half dozen that we can talk about if we have time. But one of the questions, Carl, was, how do you keep being inspired or motivated and that brings up this question, which I think you kind of alluded to just there. So as I've listened to this kind of framework or whatever, I've been inspired by it. And I think we could all benefit. Walk, walk us through this, if you will. Yeah, I think it's, um, I'm sorry, I got a truck going by. I apologize for that. Um, the, um, they, you know, so somehow naturally, I always set three-year goals and um, throughout my career. And the question is, where do you want to be in three years? And if that's where I want to be in three years, where would I be next year? Um, and what am I going to therefore do over the next 90 days? <laughs> and then redo that every three years. Um, and it's a process, therefore, of what I would say is kind of looking for that leading edge challenge and then go show up there. I, I sometimes feel like I'm you know, Wayne Gretzky was a coach, if you will. Okay, whatever, you know, go where the puck is going. But reset, resetting those goals continually, and I've done that for 40 years. And guess what? You find yourself pretty far away from where you started, okay? And so I think that's really important um, to doing that. But, but the, the basic thing is, and I write about this in the book and portfolio, I view it as a 70-20-10 problem. 70% of your effort is against delivering what, what you know you have to get done. Otherwise, you get fired. Okay, whatever. But 20% is there's too much focus on editorializing. But Clay Christensen, Innovator's Dilemma, told me this personally. He said, the problem is, is our measures are broken. We're building the bottom line, and we used to be building the top line. We used to be building revenue, and the country is worrying about building profit not building revenue and so it's stopping our growth so you have to find a new growth engine that is close enough to what you're doing that you can add top line growth and the last thing is almost like camping you know you you can't got to leave the place better than you found it and so in the process of doing something new you open up a capability gap and you have to fill it and so this works at an organizational level 
as a strategy for business and also as a personal strategy. And so I've practiced that for intentionally, you know, it's, I never, I can't say I had any idea where I wanted to go in life. That would be crazy. Who knows? Okay. But instead intentionally setting this kind of an open structure, um, gives you a personal awareness and, and causes, you know, you to challenge the current while still delivering it. Very good. Um, your, your, your statement by quote by Wayne Gretzky, which I love go where the puck is going. Uh, I'm not a hockey player, but I can appreciate that. I'm a soccer player. I know what, I know what you're saying. There well, another... I used to love the Toledo blades when I was a kid. Okay. Or whatever. And, and, um, when I was in high school, they asked us to go jo do a job kind of thing of going out and who would you like to see for jobs? And we got together with a group of people and said, we want to, we want to be hockey players. And so bring us a hockey player or let us, and they said, you're not going to be a hockey player. <laughs> and so they didn't bring us a hockey player, but anyway. Yeah. So the, the walleye, by the way, still proud to have in Toledo. And in fact, the engineering leadership Institute students that I showed you, we're going to go to the walleye and do a networking event. On, on November 12th, so that I'm looking forward to seeing the walleye play again. Um, you, that one other quote that I remember from your book, and I don't remember it completely, so hopefully you do. The CEO of Xerox at the time said something about the best way not to be lost by the future is to invent it. Did I get that about right? Yes, yeah, so there's a, there's there. So she's probably picking up um, that was Romnetti at the time. Okay. Oh no, the um, I'm I. Um, IBM, I think it was Romnetti, but okay. but she um, she was really probably quoting um, um, Gibson, who's uh, another futurist, who said the best way to to um, to predict the future is to invent it. Yeah, you know, and um, and I think that's what happens is is there's a lack of foresight, and so the reason I spend time with people like my co-author Bob Johansson or out here, but throughout my career. I've always sought out the leading edge because there you get foresight into what other people are thinking the world could be. The problem is a lot of people reject it because they say, well, that'll never happen. And it's like, well, you're being a little too left brain there. Okay, whatever. It was intended to, or it was intended to be inspirational. The world is going in that direction. And if that's true, what would I do? And that becomes that search for the something new so that it's not something that's really new to you. It's new. Very good. And I, you know, I'm thinking again, that term futurist, you, I don't think you ever, you tell me you're a futurist, but you are a futurist. I know you are. Um, and I thought we'd turn now to the concept of VUCA and, and let's help understand that a little bit before you do. Um, let me drop a couple books and see if you've read them before. And one was called the past. I knew there would be a test. You're a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> The Black Swan. Did you ever read that one about uh, uh, it was about just the idea of because you talked about forecasting. That's never going to happen. And what they're saying is the smart folks like uh, Harvard Business uh, did a great article on um, Royal Dutch Shell and their scenario planning. You got to you got to, in fact, deal with predict for get ready for the long yeah. tail, the very small frequency, but devastating. And I think we might be in a black swan event right now. Yeah. Right. And how we deal I, with it. Yeah. Yes. And so, um, so yes, but I also, um, so the author is a really interesting character. Okay. Whatever. <laughs> and so, so, um, so, um, he gets angry very easily, which seems to be a thing that many people do. Okay. About the bad use of statistics. Um, I think the most important thing, this is with, I don't want to get obscure on statistics, but I, I studied nuclear with you guys. Okay. Whatever. And so I love the math side. And so you could take me down a rabbit hole, but, um, but the, um, it, the problem is, is that people are Bayesian. Okay. Another, and so the normal distribution with thin tails is really something you see in manufacturing. It's not something you see as much in real life. And so the fat tail is there's a large number of things that are way out there. And they're, although they're at low frequency, there's so many of them, they show up in your life. And then we think it can't be because it's so far from what we think is a student T type of a norm. And so we have a wrong view of statistics in the world and it leads to a lot of wrong behaviors. And, and so there's much more probability of bad events than we think, okay? And then we get stuck in the past. Those can be opportunities too, you know? And so COVID's a horrible thing, but it certainly accelerated telemedicine by 10 years. 
It is, and it's also, uh, I think, accelerated more remote learning, right? And remote, obviously, um, working. So let me put up the next slide, Carl, before we do the VUCA thing, and walk us through some of these. You don't have to spend as you know as much time explaining every single one, but um, what did you do by mean by this one, and what can we learn? And maybe as a segue to VUCA or not. So again, yeah. you see embracing decades of change. Yeah, um, what, what, tell, yeah. tell us some things here. So this was looking back at the, so I live in Silicon Valley now. And so the question is, we're theoretically working on what's next, okay, or whatever. But it turns out, if I look back at my career and look at the things I worked on, the businesses I worked on, um, this is going back to that kind of three-year planning and asking, this thing. you come out of school and it's like, immediately, I didn't know how to do my job, okay? And so I had to go back to University of Cincinnati because I was living in Cincinnati and take some classes, okay, to do modeling beyond what I had learned and and take some finance classes so I could figure out how in the world to get money versus how to just spend money. Um, and um, but then the world went international, and so hey, guess what? I moved to South America. The world, internet happened. I started working with the Media Lab. Um, it, because that's where Bill Joy and a lot of other people were doing it. You know, what we call Internet of Things was called Things That Think in 1995. You know, and then disruption starts being a theory. And I was able to work with Clay Christensen. Um, and then startups happened and I became the head of corporate new ventures and design thinking. And I started working with a premier group of people. The reason I'm out here is because biotech is where it's at. And so I moved into health 10 years ago, almost 20 years ago. Um, and, um, and social media, um, you know, we're commercial, everything's becoming more consumer focused. And so, as opposed to being in a, a consumer person in a tech space, I'm doing consumer tech, you know? And so, so there's something about finding the leading edge and get as close to it as you can. Um, I'll say just one piece on it, which is you have to view this as give to get. And so it goes back to this reciprocity idea. Um, if you're really at the leading edge, you have to ask first, what can I give these people that they need? And then you get included and then you can, you're part of the network and then you can benefit and take from the network. People show up to Silicon Valley to try to get right away and they get nowhere because there's plenty of people who are gonna take things from here. What you have to do is figure out what can you give that's genuinely needed what I could usually give at Procter & Gamble is really cool problems and really big businesses so that we could start working on translation of theory into practice um, rather than me inventing you know, stuff. So I, I just think this um, searching out the leading edge um, and getting close to it, but knowing you have to have something to give, um, and that means you can't show up without having some skills and some experience yourself, and then you'll be invited in, and then it's easier to keep growing. Great. Hey, is now good to talk about uh, First Mile Care? Sure, so my, we can. So I currently am the CEO of a startup, um, and um, sometimes I feel that that's a failed CEO search, okay, or whatever. <laughs> what am I doing at this age doing startups, and it's hard work, and it's continuous, and everything else like that. You know, um, but, um, 30 million people in the United States have diabetes and um, 88 million people have blood sugars that are above normal and are on their way to having diabetes. Um, that's reversible by a year long lifestyle, clinically proven 4,000 people over um, four years. Um, so impressive that the CDC created a program and um, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid approved the very first um, preventative medicine approach for diabetes prevention. They were working on this for a lot of years. The research is in 2002. Um, about four years ago, only 50,000 people had ever taken it. And they said, well, this is like standard market development problem. Um, this thing really works. There's no bigger problem out there than things like diabetes prevention in the US. Let's form a business to figure out how to scale a proven thing so that it could reach the 88 million people. And so that's what our company is working on doing. We're venture funded to do that. We're in a few cities. I'm up in Detroit um, just now. Most recently, we're in Houston, San Francisco, et cetera. And, um, and we're just trying to tackle this problem. And at some level, 
I feel it's a moral imperative. If we think we could scale it and it really works, um, we can't have a $300 billion a year problem turning into all the tragedy of twice as many people with diabetes and a half a billion a year or more problem for the country. And so we should try to solve it. I don't know that we're gonna solve it, but we're gonna try and that's what we're doing. Good, that's inspiring. You know, that brings up one of the questions that one of the audience um, uh, just sent in. So I may read it to you if, if I may, because I think it's relevant. What are your views on multidisciplinary uh, and the power of crowd approaches to problem solving, especially when dealing with wicked problems? Wicked, somebody's from back east, okay. We have rock stars <laughs> out here and then you're on the west coast and we have wicked problems and that means you're on the east coast. Still care with that. <laughs> the, um, um, so, um, I, there's a challenge of being small when you're solving a problem that's new because too many people and it's all transactional and you're not really doing the work you need to do. Um, and so what I encourage people to do is to, it's very important to have multidisciplinary thinking rather than multidisciplinary teams, okay? Because if you did that and you had 10 things you needed, you'd have 10 people on the team. And right away you'd be breaking, you know, Jeff Bezos' rule about a startup um, has to be able to have no more than two pizzas, okay, to feed everybody. <laughs> and so you can get too big too fast. And um, and so you need to have this humility and this understanding of what are all the things you need. And so, so you need those perspectives at the table. Um, and without them, you're gonna not, you're gonna misname the problems. You're not be able to solve them. So multidisciplinary thinking is really really important. But teams themselves can get too big too fast. So that's one thought on it. Um, and you have to know that the yin and the yang is going to be, I always say it was Procter and Gamble and it was Hewlett and Packard and it was Jobs and Wozniak. And so the myth of the single inventor is really harmful. There's always been somebody else, you know, that was kind of like handing it off and they were talking to each other to do it. Now, relative to crowdsourcing, we spent time in the book talking specifically about this um, is, I'm a big fan of understanding that um, ideas come from everywhere, you know, and now because so you, we had the loss of distance and so people at a distance can work together. The funny thing was people fought that until COVID and now we are in this hybrid world where we realize most of the travel I did, you know, because I would travel 50% of the time. Um, throughout my career was because people at a distance didn't believe they could work with you at a distance and they had to touch you. And now there's a lot to be said about being there in person, but after you've met the people, you can work effectively at a distance. We didn't believe it. The internet's built on it, okay? <laughs> you know, and, um, and so connectivity is really, really important and not judging that other people because they don't have skills can't add value. The problem is, is, um, I am much better with serial entrepreneurs than I am with first time entrepreneurs. First time entrepreneurs are going to learn a lot of things. The problem is, is they're in a learning mode and the most successful companies actually put people together who actually have answers that they're applying. It's just, we never put those two things together before, you know, metaphorically it's, you know, um, jaws on Mars. Okay. Or whatever, you know, and it's like jaws on Mars, there's no water on Mars. And it's like, well, you, you know, Jaws on Mars, what would that movie be, right? Okay, in other words, you know, it probably look a lot like Dune, okay, whatever, in other words, you know. And so, so you need these kinds of things fighting each other um, to create something new and those ideas come from everywhere. But most crowdfunding things, you know, are actually a disaster, okay, whatever, they're, you know, um, because, you know, there's just a lot of added cost um, to bringing all those people in versus using it as a search process to find new ideas and then take somebody who's really expert in it and start really honing in on a specific problem, a specific solution. So I love it. It's a real capability, but can also be a waste of time. Very good. Well, you know, I'm the, I got a first two things, a local local example of what you talked about have multidisciplinary, but particularly two different types of people. I told you we celebrated the life of Norman Nitschke. I want to say uh, in 2004, my predecessor, Nagi Naganathan, helped celebrate the life of Harold McMaster. Two glass innovators, and, and honestly, the two of them, you know, talk about synergy, which again, your book right. is about a lot. 
either them independently wouldn't have gone anywhere. You put them together, and it was the yin and the yang and all that. So, so we're we've got that here in Toledo. I think that's a great think, example. You know, what I'll just tell you is is that um, my best advice is is to go find people that you almost that are passionate. But you even passionately disagree with, you know, I don't want to get into all the problems of, you know, the siloed problem, but, you know, uh, of thinking, whether it's at a country level or a business level or an individual level or whatever, we don't get anywhere new if we don't take people who are very different, but they can't be incompetent while they're there. They're wasting your time. <laughs> yeah. they, you know, and, and, and together we craft the experiment that we're then going to run very fast in order to find out more learning. And so I go back to statistics, it's Bayesian, starting with people who have different priors is great, but what's the context? And then you're doing risk reduction. And so the real work is Bayesian in its nature. And, and so you want somebody who has a different prior than you, you want somebody who's different than you, otherwise you're gonna be you know, having a love fest over here, but you're not gonna get anything new. Yeah, you don't mind, I can tell you a quick story about myself and, and some of the folks on it will know who I'm talking about. So I told you I'm very proud with my leadership team, four associate deans. One was it's a new position, associate dean for diversity, inclusion, and community engagement, and it's held by Dr. Leslie Burhan, who is a professor in mechanical engineering. And so I created that position, didn't have it before. And it, at that time, Leslie, when I came here, was director of diversity and inclusion. And we would get together and talk about it, and, and I, you know, wanted to elevate it. But every time, I swear, and Leslie will chuckle, I hope she'll chuckle if she hears this, we would argue, you know, we would get into these discussions and we always left kind of mad at each other because we disagreed so much. And I'm like, I can't her have her as a leader on my team, we disagree. And then I'm like, duh, <laughs> I need her on my team because I know she's right, I just don't understand it yet. And so we've been on this journey together and I think that's an example. I, you uh, know, I, a, a thought for that is, is because, um, the world is much more transparent today because of technology. And so you kind of can't hide facts anymore. Okay. And so that has a lot of, you know, it changes things. Bob and Johansson and I, when writing the book, we had one disagreement, which is about trust. Okay. In other words, you know, he said in the future, everybody will, the, the economy will be based on trust. And I told him, I can't say that because that's why I have lawyers. Okay. If I waited long mm -hmm. enough to trust people, we'd never get a deal done. That's why I have lawyers, you know? And so, so in, in truth, what I think is, is the world is very transparent. What's really important is trust is built on respect. And so the future needs more respect. And if you respect somebody, even if you disagree with them, even if you don't, if you don't trust them, that can be the basis for the relationship and that can be the basis for the trust, which is I completely find, disagree with you, but I think together we could get something done that neither of us would get done. And so that's the measure of a true partnership is, is there's something I've always wanted to do and, we, and, and I can't do it without you. And if both people say that, you have a partnership. Otherwise you have customer supplier. I wanna buy it from you, but is this the right price? Both are types of partnerships, but the one that stands apart is the one where we actually need each other. We share a goal, creating something different, and we need each other, and we acknowledge that, and that shows great respect. Then when you run into that argument, you remind yourself of why you're together. Are we still trying to get this done? And, and I think that that's really, really important. Um, but again, my focus is on creating the new. And so at some level, my expectation is, is I'm going to be working with people who I kind of don't get along with because we've never done it. And there's more friction than kind of this sense of just get it done in the production part. I respect and love the production part of my job, but it's, but, but that was managing the $12 billion of Pampers that exist, not creating the next billion you're going to add on, you know? And so, so it's a, it's, it's both types of partnerships. Yeah. Hey, you know, what you just were talking about reminds me, I, I want to share the last slide that we had prepared, because um, you've talked to me about leaders need to tell stories and, and new business, you know, that's about, I think you've been doing that today, and I think your book does it really well. So um, we're going to hopefully get some more questions from the audience. I got some there, um, but talk, talked about, you know, the stories here and the new businesses um, yeah. that you had. You know, um, you know, so, you know, we here in Silicon Valley, people talk about elevator pitches, um, um, new business. We talk about elevator pitches. Um, you know, if somebody's going to give you $5 million for a new company, 
um, in the venture world or $50 million, that company doesn't exist yet. <laughs> okay. And, um, and so it's very different from a budget process when, you know, if I had $3 billion of P&G's business or 5 billion or whatever, or 10 billion of it, I'd have to write a budget request. Well, there, we know exactly what we're doing. In other words, you know, um, you know, grow the business by this, et cetera, by doing things that we did in the past, but better or more of them. Um, you know, I think, and so that's got a story, but it's not much of a story. It's, it's more like a new chapter in the same book, right? You know, next chapter. Um, new businesses are great new stories. And one of the things that I like to think of is every business has a founder's story. And so if I work with a big company on, on innovation, you know, I ask them about their founder story and they tell me this lovely founder story, you know, and then I ask them, but what's your growth story? And it's like more of the same. And it's like, no, no, your growth story starts with, we are the people who. <laughs> and so what is it that you confronted as something major and you're going to be known for doing it? And they're going to talk about you in the same way they talked about the founders. Keep the founder's story, but find a new story that's the story of this time. You know, and and so the characteristics of those stories then are, let me tell you about a really big market that's out there, you know, the theoretical addressable market, you know, kind of thing. You know, everybody's moving to, so the world's going to hybrid, um, you know, and, um, and so there is no in-person and online anymore. People who are using that language are lost. The world is already hybrid. We just don't know how that's gonna work out. Okay, COVID happened and everybody stopped, you know, doing work the way they're doing. There's a, a number of enormous markets there. Well, what are the pains in those markets? You know, name a very specific pain that people are feeling. And I call this the rescue moment. When I'm on the side of the road and I have a flat tire and it's raining, how much am I going to pay when my tire is flat in order to get rescued there? more than I ever wanted to, okay, whatever, you know, and they're going to come out and charge me $500 and I'm going to say, this is robbery. Okay, well, I'll let you go. No, thank you. Change my tire. Okay. You know, the new business that comes out of that then is once you've shown that you were actually rescued, we can now talk about what business are you going to create, you know, and that business became, by the way, putting um, service into, you know, when you buy a new car, you know, and so nobody calls AAA anymore. If they bought a new car, the car company, you know, so you already paid for it in the new car price. So you never experienced the $500. It's even better. You paid it up front. <laughs> you know, so it's a great business model, you know, but so name a market, name a pain, then show me you can kill it. And now I'll be able to talk about the value equation because I have something specific in mind. And, and so that's the story we tell. And then we explain one last thing like Steve Jobs would do. One more thing is it's like, let me explain why I'm the only one who can do it. We are unfair competitive advantage. That story gets you money, okay? Yeah. You know, but it's not a made up story. It's not a light story. It's big market, big problem. I can do it and only I can do it. You'll get money with that. Great stuff. Uh, let me, if you don't mind me, weave in what were you doing at U Toledo in that regard. Maybe someone on the audience has heard me talk about already how excited I am to have a grant from the Kern Foundation. Uh, it stands for Kern on Engineering Entrepreneurship Network. Matt Franchetti and Norm Rapino uh, collaborated on this grant proposal. We, we've got it. And what we're doing now is bringing entrepreneurial minded thinking into not only our students, our courses, but also I want to do it working with our corporate partners in our co-ops. And so thinking back of that points of pain and creating value that you just mentioned, um, Carl, and that is some of our students are going out. We have the I-Corps, which is an NSF funded innovation core under Norm's leadership, gets teams together, students, grad students, faculty, and they go talk about points of pain, right? And it's not the question of, I got a hammer, tell me the nail you, you have that I can pound on it. It's what are your problems? What can we do? And we're doing the same thing with our senior capstone bioengineers. They're getting with the physicians down at UTMC and, and coming up with these, again, what can we do better from a, from a healthcare device? And, and what, let's get, turn on some students to go about making that happen. So we're trying to do this sort of thing and, and I'm excited about how we're moving forward. 
I think that's really key. I think, uh, it, you know, there's in the base business, we talk of, about pain points and then you kind of make it better. Okay. I'm all for that. Remember 70% grow the current business, get increase your market share versus, you know, these kinds of more radical kinds of things. I'm currently spending my time on the more radical, but you know, my, throughout my career, most of it's, you know, the base operations kind of things, you know, and, but there is a distinction between lessening a pain and completely killing it. Okay. And new businesses require killing the pain because if I have a headache and I had, I used to sell a leave, um, you know, if it kind of makes the headache a little duller, nobody's going to broadly adopt it because they're, but if it makes the headache go away, it pain kills, then people will put it into their cabinet and do it. And so there, you cannot be incremental in a new market with Febreze when we created it, we focused on the smoky jacket and that was this ability to you just went out to a bar. I can say, thank God people were still smoking in bars at that time, even though that was a horrible thing, you know, um, because everybody had had the experiment of smelling uh, the experience of smelling the jacket across the room, you know, the next day. And it's like, OK, everybody's seen that problem. Spray it with Febreze and the and the jacket instantly is wearable and the scent is this is amazing because otherwise I thought it was going to dry clean. I'm going to wait days, whatever I wanted to wear it. They were stuck like that side of the road problem. If they could have put their nose up to it and they still smelled smoke, even if it was light, we would have been dead, you know, and so so in a new business, you can't set a low threshold when you do the pain kill. You have to kill it. Then people said the problem is there aren't enough smoky jackets. Once it gets Febreze into your house for the smoky jacket, there are all other kinds of things you can do. The sofa, the curtains, the, you know, the whatever, you know, and, and so the painkiller starts the market and then you get to be incremental. But if you're incremental, the market never gets started. Good points. Very good points. Hey, we've got about uh, maybe four or five more minutes. I think I covered the things that you and I talked about that I really wanted to cover. I don't see any of the questions. What things that we not talk about today, and maybe Jen will jump in with any questions, but what, what, what things haven't we talked about that you kind of wish people would know about either Silicon Valley or you know, whatever? Um, I think that um, maybe if we come back to kind of the beginning of, of kind of the thing about, um, I think you're right. I think people are really in control of their destiny and they're not right. You know, so there's a randomness to it. Anybody who doesn't tell you that the reason the reason I'm successful is I was lucky. OK, in other words, you know, but, you know, luck, you know, you know, you know, the prepared mind and all that other kind of stuff. Yes. The difference is, is it does have to do with having some sense of of um, your own agency and you'll be able to, you know, to set these goals. For yourself, and and I think that 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 this important critical piece of kind of like refreshing your goals every so often, and having this rolling, rotating kind of refreshment of the goals, um, and and not having all the answers because now I'm on a search for. I ask people, what should I work on next? You know, in other words, you know, you know, and and I'm working on this, and I'm really struggling, you know, and um, and and so you can ask for help when you have this kind of sense of of where you're going but an openness to go somewhere else and and i i just think that 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 leads to agility and and if i had to help people understand i think of a career and i think of a business as as you're building agility into those businesses um you're not trying to be too predictive and so your word on vuca this is the military theory um volat on uncertain you know, um, complex and ambiguous. Um, and so asymmetric warfare is that way, you know, symmetric warfare, you know what they're going to do, but asymmetric terrorism is much harder than, um, than a regular war because it's coming at you from whatever. And so the problem is, is people, um, volatility is, is solved by having a, having some vision of the future. You accept the volatility, but you have to have a vision of, I wish we were going this way. Um, you know, and the most important piece is the change of the sea in a complex world. We need, we need clarity. We, we search for clarity and you're never going to get it because it's ambiguous. What you need is 
I, excuse me, your search for certainty, what you have to do is have absolute clarity. I have to be able to tell you, I know this and I don't know that. You know, because that makes you agile. And so the confusion I deal right now working with some of the people who are working on on vaccine denial kinds of things and communication on that front. And and the problem is is people are searching for certainty in a time when there is not certainty. And and so much of the communication is too certain rather than clarity. And so the clarity is the purpose of a vaccine is to stop you from dying. It's not to stop you from getting sick. <laughs> and so when people say, well, but I might feel sick, it's like, that's what vaccine, vaccines stop you from dying. But people don't want to hear that. You know, in other words, and so the problem is, is you're fighting, you know, against their, their prior observations. And so I think, you know, the world is not going to get more clear you know, on its own. But to be able to acknowledge, I know this and I don't. That's what we always say scientists do. We live in that world of doing it. And so resist certainty, but be very, very clear. You know, and so yeah. a lot of what I'm talking about is a clear path for growth for yourself, but I don't know where I'm going. Yeah, but apply this if you would, just to interrupt, because we got about two more minutes and this is still spot on. Kevin David asked a good question, my cycling buddy. As a futurist, what are your thoughts on climate change and what we as engineers can do, can do to kill it and slow climate change and keep our world livable. And it seems to me that whole issues you were just talking about, certainty, clarity, et cetera, is relevant. Two things on that. I wish, you know, that bridge of the, um, I think it's Tacoma Bridge, okay, where that falls, okay, where Narrows, yeah, yeah. Tacoma Narrows. Right. I wish everybody had that vision to understand what climate is, okay, whatever. It, when you get these swings, and, you know, that eventually it collapses and it collapses to a new level, okay, which was gravity or something else. And so what you see with variability, is increased variability is a sign of instability. The bridge is not supposed to be moving and it's moving, <laughs> whatever. And so we're having the wrong conversation so that people don't understand that it's like a collapse of a bridge. So I think it's real. So here's the thing is, is and my own son is working on water reclamation. Um, he's a Carnegie Mellon grad and um, down in LA and doing five, you know, huge, huge projects because California is doing huge water project, water reclamation. Please work on the solutions. I don't, I don't want to waste your time building the wall that's going to actually be a denial. Okay, we may need to build levee walls, but if our solution is to put money into levees so that we don't flood, we're not working on the right problem. So, so the very simple thing is, as an engineer, this is a huge engineering problem. Which piece of the problem could I be working on that is actually working towards solutions rather than working towards denial okay <laughs> we're going to need to build some levees very near me here because i live only a mile from the water the problem is is that's because we didn't do the right things that engineers would have done when they saw the variability so act now to make a difference on the real problems and then minimize the amount of expense of engineering time on mitigation very good, very good. And I think that underlies a lot of those principles for your first mile care too, and diabetes care even some of those. Well, this is great. Um, have a couple other great questions. We won't be able to get to them because I need to turn them back over to Jen. Carl, thank you so much. I really have enjoyed it. I apologize to the audience if I've gotten a little of my own gra uh, graduate research was on uncertainty, ambiguity, and strategic planning. So maybe I got carried away, but this has been wonderful for me. I look forward to having more conversations over dinner. Um, so thank you again, Jen, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I also would like to thank you, Carl. You are one of our college's most fascinating graduates and someone whose creative mind and your ability to innovate um, have always um, intrigued me. So I'm so grateful for your time and for your talent. And of course, I'd like to thank Dean Tool. You consistently make this moderating look very easy. And most of us know that that's not the case. And uh, finally, a big thank you to each of you in our virtual audience for making time to join us today. I really enjoyed seeing each and every one of you and chatting with some of you. Um, I really appreciate your ongoing interest and support. And, and some of you, your questions didn't get answered. We'll do our best to try to answer those afterwards. Um, we sure hope that you'll continue to join us for future town hall events. We actually have two more planned, uh, one in October and one in November. So stay tuned for details. Uh, we'll get those out to you um, in the next few weeks. 
And if you have specific ideas on what you'd like to see, or if you'd like to connect with um, the college, feel free to reach out to me directly. My contact information is on the foundation website, and it'll also be in the email that you will receive following this town hall. Thanks so much, everyone. Hey, thank you. Go Rockets. <laughs> Thanks, Carol.